Hi, everybody. My name is Lynn Sikwan, and I'm a member of the Public Education Committee of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Welcome to our webinar, Marijuana and CBD, Benefit or Harm for Anxiety, and our presenter, Dr. Robert Yieldling. These webinars are presented by the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, which is the leading nonprofit organization in the field of anxiety and depression. Our mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders through education with webinars like this one, practice, and research. Please take advantage of the amazing resources you'll find uh, on our website, adaa.org. You'll find a great list of treatment providers by just find, clicking on find a therapist from the home page, as well as a free peer-to-peer -peer online support group. If you have any questions after watching the webinar, please feel free to send an email to webinars at adaa.org. And finally, you can support ADAA by making a char charitable contribution on the website. Okay, let's get started. I'm really happy to introduce our presenter, Dr. Robert Yieldling. He's a clinical psychologist who is currently practicing at the Anxiety and Depression Center in Newport Beach, California. Dr. Yielding earned his doctorate in clinical psychology from the California School of Professional Psychology. He is a diplomat of the Academy of uh, Cognitive Therapy, and he currently serves as a board member for the National Social Anxiety Center, which is dedicated to fostering evidence-based treatment for social anxiety. Dr. Yielding specializes in helping adults and adolescents with depressive and anxiety disorders, specializing in treating social anxiety, insomnia, panic disorder, OCD, and managing and finding growth in life transitions. He uses cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness strategies, proven strategies that provide results. See his website at anxietyanddepression.com. Now let's turn it over to Dr. Yielding. Thanks so much, Lynn. You're welcome. Okay, great. So yeah, uh, thanks again. I'm excited to be here and talk about this subject today as it comes up often in our team meetings and client sessions as well. So I'm gonna be talking about marijuana and CBD and discussing kind of the pros and cons, benefit of harm for anxiety. Can I just, I, I think. Okay, there we go. Did the slide move for you? Uh, I think go ahead. I just, I'm not sure if it's the view we want, but go ahead. I think it should be fine. Okay, sounds good. So starting off, I'll just kind of give a general landscape of anxiety as well as cannabis use uh, in the States right now. So anxiety disorder prevalence worldwide, an estimated 284 million people have an anxiety disorder. And by anxiety disorder, and in general, that means either generalized anxiety disorder, GAD, panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, or a specific phobia. So an estimated 31% of US adults experience one of these disorders uh, in general at some time in their life. And an estimated 19% of US adults have had one of these dis anxiety disorders in the past year. Not on that list is PTSD, which used to be categorized as an anxiety disorder and certainly entails a lot of anxiety. Um, but I mentioned that because there will be some tie-ins later, uh, especially in regards to uh, CBD and some potential research around PTSD as well. So we'll kind of have that in mind. Okay. So here's the latest graph I could find in terms of where the U.S. is at in terms of legalization and different programs using cannabis. As you can see, 36 states and four territories have now passed some kind of law legalizing cannabis. This could, this could include uh, THC-based cannabis or medical marijuana as that, or CBD, all of the above, these 36 states. 15 states and three territories have adopted laws legalizing marijuana or THC-based cannabis for recreational use. 
And this has really been increasing exponentially since um, about 2012. And you can kind of see looking at our uh, country here, how widespread it's becoming. And there's this real contrast at this point between what's still the case at the federal level, which is essentially, at least on the book, seen, viewing it as an illicit drug, and what's the reality for the bulk of our country at this point in terms of um, using it um, medically in some form or, or even beyond that. Okay, so I thought I'd start off just with kind of some uh, vocabulary, because even I get kind of confused with all the different terms and, and what's what and that kind of thing. So for viewers who maybe aren't too familiar, the base of what we're talking about is the cannabis plant, which has several different strains. You know, uh, most often or the ones you'll hear about is canna cannabis sativa or cannabis indica. And within that cannabis plant, there's groups of different compounds, uh, chemical compounds. And one of those groups of compounds is the cannabinoids. Uh, and this is gonna entail both the THC compound, which is the well-known kind of psychoactive compound that leads to the different effects of intoxication you've heard of, kind of et cetera. A different group of compounds is the cannabidiol or CBD. Uh, this is the most abundant uh, cannabinoid uh, compound group in hemp, but it's also in you know, the cannabis plant or cannabis uh, sativa, but it's non-psychoactive. Uh, it, it doesn't lead towards the high or the different psychoactive properties that you might traditionally think of in, in marijuana. So, it's been extracted and it's singularized and used for different uh, growing health purposes, as we're going to talk about. The term marijuana itself is probably, you know, maybe the most confusing here because it kind of means different things at different points. Marijuana can mean the same thing as just the cannabis plant, you know, the marijuana plant. Or more often, it's probably used as meaning a THC-based cannabis product. You know, marijuana, something that has THC that's used and you're going to experience the psychoactive uh, effect or kind of a high from it. Because CBD so, can't make me high. CBD can't make you high, correct. Okay. In general, it shouldn't. <laughs> but uh, as we'll kind of talk about it, it's a really important point actually that comes up is um, how we don't really have the exact science and practice of ensuring the CBD purity and dosage. Mm -hmm. So if you went to a common dispensary and bought CBD right now, not knowing much about it, if there, you don't really know how much THC might be in it. Uh, mm -hmm. Some CBD products have a fair amount, up to three, four or five percent of THC in it, and it's just labeled as CBD. Another one might have some minimal amount that's, that's negligent, has zero in it. So part of the issue we're facing right now is exactly that. We don't totally know exactly uh, what contains what in a very regulated trusting kind of way. So CBD, something labeled as a CBD product in general shouldn't contain at least too much THC that would have an effect, but that's not something never know. <laughs> yeah, at the best point. So that's, that's kind of an ongoing challenging question. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the cannabis use numbers in the states. So prevalence has been increasing uh, along with that graph that showed legalization increasing, prevalence of use has been increasing pretty steadily. There's been a 45% increase from 2007 to 2014. More importantly is the increase in what's called heavy users. These are individuals who would use cannabis daily or near daily. That's kind of what we're going to talk about as a heavy user or beyond daily, multiple times daily. That's going from one in nine to over one in three from 1992 to 2014. So that's a big increase. That means that the use among users, uh, within the use among users, the bulk of cannabis consumption is increasingly becoming concentrated around a smaller number of heavy users more and more, you know, as time kind of progresses here. 
and maybe you're going to get to this later, but um, there's often been a distinction that when they talk about a reliance or addiction is that there's a difference between the daily user and the recreational user uh, in terms of impact. Um, and I don't know if you're getting to that later or you Absolutely. might. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Most of these kind of real serious impacts we're going to talk about are going to be connected to this general term heavy user, like you're saying, and that okay. frequency of use. Yeah. Which ties right into the, uh, the next point here, which is that quote unquote self-medication or using cannabis in a way that's beyond infrequent recreational and is used in a way to regulate or modify your mood or your affect habitually and this kind of thing. Using cannabis or marijuana in that way in states with legalization uh, among individuals with anxiety and mood disorders is the highest. Mm -hmm. So that, what that means is in states like mine in California, the rates of people who are using marijuana in a way that's self-medicating habitually is higher than states that don't have this legalization uh, status mm -hmm. quite yet. You can, you know, I guess about different reasons why that might be. There's certainly the oh, proliferation of the legalization happening. There's dispensaries popping up all over the point, uh, all over the place. There's even uh, delivery points that can knock on your door and uh, kind of deliver your, your cannabis in that kind of way without even having to go out or drive or, or go anywhere. There's shifting public perceptions around it. It's increasingly seen as less stigmatized, as having more of a therapeutic value. It's an all natural uh, means towards you know, health, so to speak, is kind of what the perceptions are shifting towards. And there's reasons they're shifting in that direction, but the reasons aren't necessarily based off the research we have available yet. So there's something going on there that we can kind of you know, dive into a little bit. Okay, here's an example. So this is, I just did a screen grab off of a common uh, cannabis dispensary website. And this is the kind of marketing that you'll be likely to find pretty easily that uh, we get related to THC based cannabis at this point. This one kind of says conquer your social anxiety. And you can see six different products of marijuana on the bottom there that they're kind of advertising as being the helpful therapeutic ones for social anxiety. So there's this marketing and social shift towards really viewing this thing as, you know, kind of you know, micromanaging your high and using this for social anxiety and this for insomnia anxiety and this, you know, this uh, product's going to be for that. And this is kind of the uh, social and commercial atmosphere that's happening and has been happening, you know, for a while now that we're going to see as Kind of way over here, but in contrast to the actual research, which is still kind of way back here. So this is just kind of give a sense of what people are actually seeing, you know, what they're looking at when they're buying their products and the way they're thinking about uh, using cannabis um, before they're coming into your office or kind of on their own. Uh, this is kind of the this is kind of the focus out there right now. Okay, so as we know, cannabis use is increasing and more and more people are using marijuana and CBD to help with their anxiety symptoms. So let's look at some numbers around this. Anxiety ranks among the top five medical symptoms that North Americans report using medical marijuana for. A big study in 2019 found that more than half of US adults perceive cannabis as having a medical use, that's THC and CBD. Here's, here's the important one though. Results show that approximately 29 to 30% of THC marijuana consumption was used to reduce stress and anxiety. So something, something's big is going on there that the THC, this is marijuana being used that frequently for the number one reason means stress or anxiety. Participants reported using CBD to replace medications uh, to reduce pain. There is evidence supporting that stress and anxiety and for better sleep. And THC again was used most to reduce uh, stress and anxiety. And isn't anxiety one of the ones on the list uh, for medical marijuana approval kind of? 
Well, I'm going to go into it in a little bit more detail. Okay. But okay. At, at go this, ahead. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll get there. But at this point, no, not you know evidence at least THC based uh, marijuana, not really indicated. You know, as having a lot of research to back it up. Okay, so this is kind of a surprising result, like uh, as you're asking, because this marijuana has gained this kind of widespread approval. And a lot of people think that as, as a treatment for mental health conditions, and it's been legalized uh, for many therapeutic uses, you know, pain relief, you know, these kind of things, nausea, uh, different diseases, but the research isn't there in terms of anxiety, you know, and stress, but it's being used in this way. So what's going on? So what does the research actually show? Like you're asking, should I be using marijuana? That, again, this is THC based uh, cannabis products for my anxiety. At this point, scientific data does indicate the potential therapeutic value of, or I'm sorry, does, one second. My screen got blocked here. That should say. Um, it is okay. up there. Okay, yeah. yeah. So scientific data does indicate the potential therapeutic value of cannabinoid drugs, primarily THC, for several things, pain relief, control of nausea and vomiting, and um, that being correlated to different kind of diseases and these kind of things, and appetite stimulation, you know, especially in patients who might be undergoing chemotherapy or these kind of things can be very helpful for these things. However, a recent comprehensive review did not identify any really good quality literature that reported cannabis as an effective treatment for anxiety symptoms. Again, that's THC-based cannabis. Beyond that, frequency of use is associated with increased anxiety symptoms and future incidents of some problems, in particular, social anxiety disorder being one of them. And we'll look at some more examples of this. Okay. So despite the state of this research, uh, the public clearly reports using cannabis to reduce anxiety, and it's increasingly viewed as an adaptive way to cope. So why might this be? One big reason is that low doses of THC do reportedly engender anti-anxiety effects. You know, this does happen out there. And this is, you do see this, and like you're saying, a lot of people are gonna report this, and it's true. Uh, low doses are going to probably, in some most people are sometimes, uh, reduce anxiety and offer kind of a relaxing effect. However, you, uh, as I'm sure everyone kind of knows, you got to be careful because higher dosers will do the exact opposite. And they can often very commonly lead to increased anxiety, panic, um, Paranoia kind of feeling. Well, yeah, many people who I might meet with who describe their first panic attack, you know, kind of describe something like this of having too much THC or being dehydrated and, and using THC and these kind of things. So there's kind of this paradox with it where low doses will probably be relaxing, but higher doses are going to really totally do the opposite. More importantly than that is that heavy use and chronic use, like those heavy users we were talking about who use daily, every other daily, especially to regulate mood and affect, it's going to build up in their system. And there's going to be a, a sort of a dependence that happens where it, when they stop using or when they're no longer intaking THC, there's likely going to be some withdrawal symptoms. There's going to be anxiety, uh, altered appetite or sleep. There's likely going to be irritability or kind of an irritable mood and irritable depression that can kind of develop. And these are going to be very uncomfortable things. And if the very reason that they were using THC was to kind of modulate some of those aversive feelings, here they are coming back tenfold when they stop using, what's going to happen? further use. So they're going to get caught in this uh, cycle of kind of using it, but it could become self-perpetuating of these very issues that they were looking to find help with around it. So this is kind of partially what explains kind of this discrepancy between what the research shows and why it's so often viewed as a way of helping anxiety, because 
a person might go through a particular night, you know, or moment and use it in a way that truly brought their anxiety down or they were able to, they were able to cope with a social situation and they got through it by using it that way. Uh, but there was kind of the devil in disguise there and that they were actually not ultimately helping themselves through something like an anxiety disorder by using it in that way. It was actually exacerbating the problem. A lot of my clients say I, I had my social anxiety, but this helps me get out the door and helps me be social. Um, and, uh, and so what's wrong with that, right? If I can't, you know, get out with, without it, what, what should I do? What am I supposed to do? Bingo. Mm -hmm. And they're probably right at the outset that it does help them to get out the door, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it probably does kind of shift their mood or affect or physiology or thinking, and they're able to get out the door that day by using THC, using marijuana. But is the disorder, is the social anxiety decreasing over the long run in the course of their life? Mm -hmm. Or is what's actually happening is they're using it temporarily in that way but perpetuating the need for further use of it in that way and missing out on the opportunity to do something different, which is of course what we do, you know, in, in developing skills like in cognitive behavioral therapy and finding alternative ways of uh, identifying and altering and facing that fear in a way to truly tolerate it, you know, and overcome it. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're kind of staying in the same place by using it to get out the door that way. Have you ever thought it can be combined in some way? To, to, to meet the needs? Well, I think when it comes to THC, probably not. But as I'm going to get to, mm -hmm. there's the potential, too early to say, but maybe, you know, using uh, some combination with CBD might be effective, more effective you know, as kind of a combination. I'll talk about that more in a bit. Okay. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend it in terms of THC based cannabis products. Okay. So we're kind of, uh, this is good because we're kind of already talking about this, but this is, um, these are just some screen uh, shots of a Twitter feed I was randomly uh, scrolling through at some hour of the night this week. And uh, the thread was around uh, anxiety and cannabis. And this just kind of shows some of the, well, at times humorous, but uh, kind of perspectives of how people are thinking about cannabis use for anxiety. So this one person says, indica makes me so tired that I don't get anything done, and that gives me more anxiety. Or another person wrote, I prefer sativas so I can blame my anxiety on the weed instead of myself. Or another person wrote, just like you said, sativa is the only thing that gets me out of bed and allows me to talk to people without fear. Mm -hmm. This person says, oddly enough, I have an anxiety disorder, but indicas make me more paranoid, so I prefer sativas. Is that weird? Question mark. So these kind of show a couple points to me. On the one hand, it kind of shows that in terms of someone who wants to say, is you know, sativa the good thing for my anxiety? Is indica the good thing for my anxiety? What's the right way to you know take it? What's the good one? Uh, there's no real answer. You know, someone might tell you there is, but it, depending on the person, the situation other compounds involved in what the product they're taking, there's not anything close to a scientifically based answer to the rights we for you in any particular moment or situation. And the other one, it kind of shows how people are thinking about it though. This kind of is like, yeah, this is that research we saw that people are perceiving THC, perceiving cannabis in this way that uh, they can kind of fine tune and is gonna be helpful for their anxiety. But um, again, we're kind of recognizing the problems and challenges with that kind of uh, approach to it here. Okay, so we'll go from Twitter to this uh, more academic theory-based model here. This is by um, Buckner and his colleagues. And what this is, is just kind of a, a little bit more detailed and nuanced theory around this general idea of self-medication. So this is a model for people with social anxiety disorder, you know, what the motivation for cannabis use or substance use, you know, would be. So for example, one person might um, want to smoke to get out the door to be able to socialize. And there might be m multiple layers of that. They might be having many thoughts before they walk out the door of how am I going to look? Am I going to be judged? 
is something bad going to happen? And am I going to know what to say in the social interaction? Am I going to get rejected? Uh, they're flooded with these negative, aversive, anticipatory thoughts. So by smoking or using the THC before walking out the door, what happens to those evaluation fears? They're just kind of able to be numbed out. Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? I don't have to think about that anymore. And that's what it's doing. Or maybe the person's starting to feel incredibly nauseous or their stomach's becoming upset because of the anxiety before walking out the door. So what does smoking do? Oh, it calms their digestive system. So they're managing their physiological arousal in that moment before walking out the door. Perhaps it's to avoid social evaluation or some kind of negative social judgment. Oh, everybody else is you know, doing it, so I'm going to avoid any negative social evaluation. It might facilitate their social confidence in some kind of way, or it might just increase positive affect. So there's multiple layers. Uh, and if you're working with someone or, or even you know, someone kind of learning this for themselves, you want to think about in detail, okay, what's the function of this use for me without any pressure or judgment around it, starting to think and observe how and why and what function is this serving? or multiple functions does this serve in a particular kind of way? And do I want to set myself up to create a dependence on this substance to manage this component here? Or, you know, if I want to find, I'm involved in, you know, treatment or therapy or find help on your own or self-help, it's like, how can I know these functions and look to develop alternative skills to manage these evaluation fears, manage that fear of judgment? manage my physiological arousal? Um, what other pathways of, of targeting these components can you find for yourself? And that's, got, that's kind of how I, I would, um, you know, approach someone with this mm -hmm. uh, challenge here. Okay, so in summary regarding uh, THC, dangers of overutilization, particularly in heavy users, for coping motivated cannabis use. That's kind of would be my main thing to focus on and take away from it. The dangers it can create would be leading towards, like I was just talking about, a psychological dependence. It's gonna interfere with the possible learning that could happen by not using it and learning how to cope with those feelings and get out the door anyway, which ultimately over the long run is gonna maintain the symptoms of anxiety. Uh, it can exacerbate the symptoms over time, like we were saying, through just maintaining the course of the disorder and even exacerbating physiological kind of withdrawal symptoms. Uh, could potentially lead towards greater reliance on the substance or even an overt substance use disorder. And there's especially high risk around chronic use in adolescence. There's new you, Are you going to say more about that? Um, I, I see a lot of that in my practice. Oh, yeah. um, and and they're, they're smoking alone and often to go to sleep um, or at the end of the day, um, rather than uh, in the socially anxious kind of situations of going out there, it's, it's kind of isolated uh, alone um, use. So. Yeah. yeah, especially if there's an adolescent who's in this kind of high, you know, high use, you know, daily to every other or, or more, yeah. then there's even some more recent research about how how dangerous kind of the long-term associations are with that. Things like depression, earlier onset of psychotic symptoms, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. suicidality. These are the things that are being linked to intense adolescent use. You know, this is the time where the brain is still developing during adolescence. And using THC with that frequency around that time is gonna alter the wiring. It can even impact uh, there's some studies that can even in, impact IQ scores, you know, permanently using mm -hmm. it frequently around adolescence. So if there's one thing to highlight to be wary of and intervene and trying to find alternative coping methods for it would be, you know, that kind of use in an adolescent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so not necessarily encouraging therapeutic news for cannabis when it comes to THC-based products but certainly some understanding of, of the nuances of it, of how it works and the dangers of it to be aware of. How about cannabidiol? How about CBD? What does the research show? Can I, should I, can I be using CBD for my anxiety? 
Well, as in terms of right now, you know, the, that same comprehensive review found limited evidence that CBD is effective for anxiety symptoms. However, in terms of this study, limited is something. Uh, it's, it, these are kind of stringent uh, terms that they use to define it. Basically, it means that it's, just, it's brand new. You know, the research is picking up the past couple of years, but it's still really in its infancy, and it's not grown to the point of having firm, recommended, um, proven uh, recommendations for it, for anxiety at this time. That being said, let's look into a little bit more detail on what some of these very initial studies and the directions you know, they might point us in here. And again, we're talking about CBD. So this is now the non-psychoactive compounds of hemp or of cannabis, not the products that are gonna be giving any kind of high, shouldn't be at least. Um, that's kind of what we're talking about now. Okay. So starting off, there is this one study that showed CBD was shown to reduce acute anxiety assessed by a public speaking test in patients with social anxiety disorder. So what happened was there was a, you know, a group of patients who had social anxiety and they were kind of impromptu giving this performance task of giving a public uh, speaking activity, which of course would induce anxiety you know, for people who had social anxiety disorder. And the group that was given CBD right before acutely uh, was shown to report that it had an anxiolytic effect, an anti-anxiety effect. They reported less stress, less anxiety giving that public speaking test mm -hmm. versus the people with social anxiety who didn't uh, receive the CBD, who received a placebo. So this is kind of the, these were kind of some of the initial studies is what they're showing that acute administration, at least in Initially, it does lead towards kind of the subjective reduction in anticipatory or uh, performing anxiety regarding, at least most of them are around social anxiety as an example of anxiety, but it's kind of showing this uh, overall anti-anxiety acute effect that it will kind of play. Uh, and there's a couple studies showing that, you know, at this point. So that's interesting. Let's, let's say these are going to continue and, you know, the evidence is going to build around it and we're going to kind of find that maybe CBD does offer this calming acute effect. And that's something that's interesting, but even with that, I would say there's a difference we want to be aware of between uh, what's helpful with reducing acute anxiety and what's actually helpful with something like social anxiety disorder, the course of a disorder. So, we, you know, we want to think about everything in context, you know, in, in CBT, we're always looking at what are, you know, what really needs to change? What are, what are the maintaining variables that are contributing to this disorder being maintained over time? And one of them is typically avoidance, avoidance of feeling anxiety, avoidance of uh, feeling anxiety in social interaction situations. And again, if we're taking something to reduce that anxiety every time habitually, then we're still not going to necessarily develop the skills or shift in thinking or coping confidence that's going to actually relieve something like the whole disorder over time. So it's interesting, but we want to be kind of careful that they just based off the off of these, I'd say, you know, if you're have something every now and again, like a speech or a presentation or something like that, and uh, CBD is used every every now and then to kind of reduce it, or um, perhaps if it was for uh, anxiety around falling asleep, if you used it once a month or you know periodically like that, and it did have that calming effect for you, then uh, that might make sense. But on the other hand, the same I would argue the same principle applies that falling into using this habitually. Uh, this is what I'm relying on to feel less anxious. And without that, those fears of mine are still just as real. You're not gonna tackle uh, what really needs to be tackled to overcome, you know, something like uh, a social anxiety disorder or a panic disorder or something like that. But if it lets me get to the party, I, doesn't it kind of wear off and I still have to use my skills once it wears off? It you will still have to use your skills once it wears off. Yes, I would imagine you'll feel your anxiety will jump right when you notice it's starting to wear off and uh, that might be a challenging scenario. So yes, it is good that it gets you to the party and that might be an interesting way of potentially using it. You know, if, if we were working with someone individually and that's kind of how we conceptualized and planned for it mm -hmm. 
And the commitment was to still be there and use your skills or have an exposure to do something at the party. Uh, perhaps it's better to get to the party with, uh, in that way without other than kind of not getting there at all. You know, mm -hmm. if, it can, if you can yeah. test it out and it would still be productive by the end of the night, uh, possibly, possibly. Uh, but on the other hand, if you know, we always need CBD and there's no growth beyond that, if it stays like that, then mm -hmm. probably not. But if it's in the service of building that exposure and confidence and eventually you commit and don't need it to get to the party, then yeah, mm -hmm. maybe that would be a, a potential, you know, you could kind of work out with. I'd want it to be in a very individualized kind of plan, you know, doing that with someone, but possibly, possibly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this was another study, a little bit different. This study looked at adolescents, uh, well, 18 to 19 year olds uh, in Japan who had social anxiety. And this was different from those other studies because this actually was over the course of four weeks and the individuals with social anxiety were just taking uh, the milligrams, I don't, I don't have the exact dosage off the top of my head right now, just once per day over the course of four weeks compared to individuals with social anxiety who didn't take the CBD. And you can kind of see these are two different uh, social anxiety scales, the two graphs. And you can see on the one on the left, the blue uh, bars, uh, you can see the individuals who are taking CBD once per day uh, reported a significantly decreased uh, symptomology of social anxiety over the course of those four weeks. Same with the different social anxiety, the Leibowitz social anxiety scale on the right individuals taking CBD once per day uh, reported less overall social anxiety over the course of those four weeks. So this is a little bit more interesting because it's not necessarily just taking it in that acute moment of performance or anxiety, it's taking it kind of overall, a little bit more chronically, which is encouraging that it's kind of showing these results, but there's still, no long-term follow-up on the study beyond those four weeks. So we don't really know what happens continuing after that, or if the you know, CBD use stopped, you know, what happened from there. So still kind of an, an initial study, but interesting and, and good in the fact that it was more, a little bit more of a, a chronic kind of use, you know, versus more acute use. Okay. So, Here's some other interesting studies with CBD. There's some initial evidence that CBD can enhance what's called extinction learning, which means it might serve like you were asking about and we're kind of hinting at here. In the future, it might turn out to serve as a potential adjunct to behavioral therapies, exposure therapies, uh, like what happens in CBT or behavioral therapy for anxiety disorders. So what this kind of means is that using, adding CBD, to a behavioral kind of relearning process. For example, say um, someone was uh, afraid of heights and in order to conquer their fear of heights, they wanted to try to extinguish or create extinction learning around that fear or that condition stimulus. So what they're gonna do is we're gonna expose to frequent and prolonged situations that involved kind of a progressive facing of fear of heights scenarios. And what this study kind of demonstrated is that doing something like that, but administering CBD, even after some of that extinction learning had occurred, so after those exposures had kind of shifted some learning, that enhanced how strong that extinction learning uh, progressed. So what that means is that enhanced uh, someone's ability to feel diminished anxiety around Fear of heights is an analogy, but a situation like that, this enhanced the learning to say, that doesn't have to be as much of a threat for me. And that's over the course of time. You know, that's kind of more uh, longer term. So this is really where I get interested in the potential of it because it might uh, be able to find a way. We don't know exactly the timing or the dosage or how yet, but there might be ways of it being able to enhance already proven evidence-based strategies to habituate to fearful scenarios or 
whether it's a kind of a phobia or whether it's something like a trauma from the past, connecting it back to PTSD, there might be something there that helps um, reorganize the memory or, and the learning or enhance it in ways to start to feel less, less of a threat response to these built up fearful scenarios that people experience. So this, another study kind of showed a similar thing. CBD may, may help produce an enduring reduction in learned fear expression when given strategically along with behavioral treatment. So it's very initial, very, it's very early on, but there's could be this helpful um, contributory effect that CBD might play along with something like traditional um, behavioral exposure strategies to decrease fear expression to things like fear in social scenarios or fear in past traumas or fear in phobias, or we might be able to find these areas where we can apply this and the benefits of it, you need to learn more about exactly how, but the benefits of it really might help in the future to develop stronger treatments, you know, in, in terms of um, other proven behavioral treatments for anxiety disorders. So these are, these are kind of the fascinating studies for me about the potential of this. And if we can get this, the studies going further and further where this might, uh, you know, more nuance it and get some actual guidelines of direction, what this actually might look like. Um, these, are, these are kind of the exciting parts of it from, from what I'm seeing here. Okay, so let's kind of summarize a little bit the picture with CBD. Most current studies, again, still examine more acute single CBD dosing in healthy subjects. So further studies are required to establish whether chronic dosing of CBD has similar effects. Well, we still need to get more studies around that. But overall, you know, the, the, the summary of reviews really emphasize the potential value of CBD in treating anxiety disorders. But I need to add to that, we're nowhere near knowing exactly, you know, how, when, and having a protocol for it. So there's need for further study of CBD in the treatment of anxiety disorders. And what really needs to happen is we need to develop and standardize dosing um, studies to inform you know, what the dosing strategy is going to be exactly, which means how much, when, for which disorder, in which situation, for which patient, et cetera. Uh, again, we, we don't still don't really have a clear way of determining the purity of, of CBD, you know, that we know we're getting CBD and the right one and the right dosage. It's like we need to have ways of straightening that out. Uh, but if we can kind of move in that direction, um, we'll be able to determine, you know, what CBD's place as an alternative, as uh, an alternative or again, supplemental therapy to ev other evidence based approaches like, CB, uh, like CBT. So it'll be interesting and fascinating to keep a watch and um, see how this. Uh, this research and the subject progresses here. Okay, so again, here's my information. And if there's any, of course, follow up questions, uh, feel free to get in contact with me and I'll be happy to share what I know and what I learn more in the future. Uh, Dr. Yelling, a number of people talk about using CBD for sleep and even ask about giving their kids a CBD for sleep. What do we know about it helping sleep, which is commonly going on with anxiety? Yeah. Depression? Well, I think what the studies are kind of showing is that it does offer some of that probably uh, at this point, the only, the only reference would be some of that acute anti-anxiety effect. So if anxiety is the thing getting in the way of the sleep or falling asleep, then it very well could offer kind of a short-term benefit of decreasing that anxiety, which might allow someone to fall asleep, you know, easier. But I'd offer the same cautions with it that using it in that kind of way, um, it might be better than you know the other prescribed sleep medications out there in the sense that it might have less side effects or potential for you know tolerance or addiction or other kinds of things. Yeah. But it still might not get to the heart of what you need for enduring skills and strategies or get to the heart of the problem for, you know, what's kind of driving the insomnia. So it might help in the short term, but I wouldn't recommend using it habitually at this point still or coming to rely on it or use it as a substitute for other great treatments that are still available out there to use that, you know, between CBT and mindfulness-based approaches and sleep hygiene. And I would go to these places first, you know, certainly to try and develop it. 
Um, in terms of children, I wouldn't recommend that now. I think there was like one, one anecdotal uh, study I found around using CBD for insomnia in a 10 year old, but uh, the studies are just kind of nowhere near frequent enough to kind of have a recommend around that for someone, you know, at that age, certainly. So I would, I would stay away from that. And if I find marijuana helpful for me, how can I help getting, not get dependent on it? Mm. Well, when it comes to THC, you know, and marijuana using it in that way, uh, do your best as soon as you can to kind of start to do what I was talking about earlier. Start to really look at and understand the function of use that it might be serving for you. And if it's going down that road of leading towards kind of the quote unquote self-medication or using it to modulate affect or anxiety or these other kinds of things, then it's going to quickly go in a direction that's going to exacerbate the problem. So I would recommend as soon as you can, you know, becoming aware of that, you know, uh, trying your best to uh, only use it in ways that aren't fulfilling that function. So, you know, if you're using it recreationally or to relax or enjoy or whatever it is sporadically, then that's another thing. But I would recommend trying to alter the function of the use, or if that's a real challenge to do, and you're, you're kind of find yourself lacking the skills or ability to kind of do that on your own, that would be the point in time where I'd recommend kind of reaching out for help. Uh, whatever that's going to look like for you, you know, uh, social help or friend help or therapeutic help, that's the time to really say, wait, I can, there are other skills and proven strategies I can develop to learn how to get out the door or to regulate this feeling or to cope with this situation. Let me try and explore those sooner rather than later before the uh, self-fulfilled increased problems develop over using THC in that kind of way. So that would be, you know, that'd be what I'd recommend for it. And I know everyone's different, but if I'm a parent and I know that my uh, adolescent or young adult is kind of using daily and, and using, as I said, alone, what, what, sir, what does that usually serve in your, in your clinical experience um, when, you know, when, uh, when there's daily use, but it's really kind of solitary and, and not when facing, you know, anxiety provoking or difficult situations? Yeah. It, it might not be related to a function of use for anxiety in that situation. It might be it's probably not a social anxiety or something like that. Maybe they're just kind of using it on their own to regulate their mood, you know, or their affect in some mm -hmm. kind of way. Mm -hmm. Or they're trying to regulate, you know, perhaps a depression by increasing that positive affect or that numbness mm -hmm. or whatever that's coming along with it. That would be the questions I would probably see as likely or to look into. Mm -hmm. So you'd want to kind of formulate and, and kind of dive into, you know, trying to individually find the answer to that question with each person, with each client. I stay away from blanket kind of assumptions of why it's happening. Right. Try, try and dive into the details of what the actual thoughts and motivation and what it's actually doing. It's a great question. That's what we exactly need to find out for every person we're talking to is, specifically what it's doing. Is it shifting? Is it numbness? Is it shifting mood? Is it avoiding something? Mm -hmm. That's all great helpful information to start to understand and, and try and work with, find more helpful avenues to, to meet that need. And one more question. If, um, ha, do you know anything about taking CBD along with other medicines? Not much research I'm aware of on that too much. Other than I know, Other than it can potentially interfere with some things, but not that I've seen as being too much yet in terms of major red flags with it, but it's, I don't think the research is available that I know of or that I've seen to really give a strong answer on. I'd still be careful, you know, for mm -hmm. sure, taking other prescription medications or you know, um, psychotropic medications. I would certainly talk to my psychiatrist around it and not just start taking it, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. potentially, but um, I'm not too aware of specific, you know, research on it. Well, thank you, Dr. Ewing. This has been very helpful. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we finish up in addition to your presentation? Uh, no, that's it. Just to be excited to keep an eye on the research, but to remain patient as the gap between the legality and the social scene of it uh, is much farther ahead of the research right now. So just to be aware of that gap and to be skeptical and patient before we catch up to actual real you know, kind of recommendations for this, but to be excited about CBD and the potentials at the same time. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.